Dr. Lauren Woolsey is professor of astronomy and physics at Grand Rapids Community College, where she's been for about five years now. She went to the University of Maryland College Park for undergraduate studies, and while on her way to getting a bachelor's degree in both astronomy and physics, she served as a teaching assistant and also an intern at the Goddard Space Flight Center. She wrote an honors thesis on the tilted axis of the planet Uranus using nonlinear resonances. No, she's not going to talk about that. She writes in her bio that after a summer research experience for undergraduates in solar physics, she decided to concentrate on the study of our central star, the sun, in graduate school, and what better topic. She did that at Harvard University, focusing on the magnetic fields of the solar corona and how they affect the outflows from the sun called the solar wind. While working on her PhD dissertation, she was a teaching fellow for three semesters at Harvard, concentrating on techniques for teaching astronomy to non-science majors. She gets a lot of practice in that at, at uh, GRCC. She earned her PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard in 2016, prior to coming here to Grand Rapids Community College. She notes that her favorite topics in astronomy are solar physics, of course, as well as exoplanets and stellar evolution. She notes that we learn more and more each day about how our solar system is both common and in some ways rare, and therein lies a possible subject for her next appearance. She's also designed a board game about stellar evolution that's been made, uh, it's been on in tabletop game festivals. So there you go. She's very, very versatile. Um, she's now also, since fall of 2019, has been the Open Educational Resources Coordinator for GRCC. She said that she loves GRCC because she enjoys sharing her passion for astronomy with others, the questions students ask in the lectures and labs that constantly keep her looking at, at the world in new ways. I quote, astronomy and physics allow us to develop critical thinking skills while learning about the world, the universe, and everything else around us. Sounds great. Let's welcome Lauren Wilsley back to GRAAA and the distance ladder climbing to the heavens. And I believe you have to set up a PowerPoint, correct? We're all applauding. Thank you, thank you. All right, so um, yeah, I've been I've been teaching online and hybrid this whole um, this whole pandemic. So I'm kind of old hat at at Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll see it um, and be able to answer those. And then there's going to be plenty of time to talk um, at the end as well. Uh, thank you for the for the elaborate um, introduction. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed now. But uh, it's great to be back here. So um, my, my idea for uh, this uh, came from conversations after I had finished our, the previous talk I gave to, um, to all of you about uh, spectroscopy of the sun, kind of a historical and science background. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed putting these slides together. So I'm, I'm excited to debut this one uh, for, for all of us. Okay. So um, the idea behind the distance ladder is there's lots of different ways to measure distance um, and they work for different amounts of, um, for different distance, uh, distances themselves. So the general outline, um, we're gonna start with a measuring tape just so that we get some kind of key ideas out of the way. We'll talk about how we can measure distances in our solar system and then we'll start to get to uh, stars and galaxies and how we get distances to all of those. All right, so if we think about a measuring tape, um, I like to start with it because it's something we can all uh, think about and recognize. And if I gave you a meter stick or a measuring tape that could only go about three feet, um, three feet in length, and I asked you to measure the, the length of the room that you're in, you could probably do it by setting down um, from start to end and then from start to end. But if you wanted to do a little bit faster, you could measure one stride that you take and then just take strides across the room. 
And what you've done is you've calibrated one method, your stride, by having a direct measurement of that method with the measuring tape. So this idea of having direct measurements near the base of this distance ladder that will help us calibrate bigger measurements um, is one that we're gonna see for all of these different things linked together. All right, so we'll start with in the solar system. Um, radio detection and ranging, or radar, is used here on Earth all of the time, um, if you've ever been caught in a speeding trap or anything else, um, but it is also used uh, to get measurements within the solar system because we can send a radio signal to a planet and have it bounce back, and we actually get a measurement for um, that distance. So the idea is we send out that radio signal, we measure how long it takes to receive that signal back, and because we know the speed of light, we can calculate that distance. So speed and time, we get distance. So that's all fine and good, and that works if you've got something that you can wait around to get the, the signal to bounce back to you. Um, we use radio for almost everything, um, but I also like to mention the um, laser ranging as well. Um, back in undergrad in my sophomore year, I did a whole project on the retro reflectors um, on the moon, just, just a research project for a physics class. Uh, and so they're near and dear to my heart. It was one of my favorite things to, to just learn about. Um, but the Apollo missions put some, put some um, retro reflectors on the moon. And so whenever we feel like it, we can just measure how far away the moon is by shining a light at it. I think that's kind of amusing. There are a lot of satellites that use retro reflectors to make sure that those orbits haven't been um, adjusted at all. There's a lot of uses for both radar and laser ranging to kind of keep track of where things are. But both of these ideas, they can't work for stars. So it's nice to start with them to kind of recognize that there are things we can do within our solar system, but we really haven't even started climbing that ladder yet. This is all kind of on the ground, as it were. Okay, so parallax is the first big idea in our um, in our distance ladder. We can think about an everyday uh, kind of example of it, and that tends to help us be able to, to think about this a little bit more. This is something that surveyors use. Um, so this picture here, this is from OpenStax um, Astronomy. But this is, this is an idea of if a surveyor didn't wanna have to cross this stream, or maybe it was too far away, but we wanted to know how far away that tree was, we can set up some simple um, triangles and use geometry to get that distance. So the idea is, is we have these two survey equipments, these theodolites, and we figure out the angle, if we point one of the theodolites at uh, the other, and then swing it around to the tree, we measure that interior angle of the triangle, and then we do it the same with the other theodolite, and we get that angle then we've got enough parts of the triangle because we measured how far away we put those two pieces of equipment um, that we can get that distance to the tree, which is a dashed line in this picture. Okay, all of that sounds great, but we're not gonna put survey equipment out into space. So how does this actually work for astronomy? So it's a very similar process, but rather than putting two separate instruments out somewhere, all we do is we wait for the earth to move around in its orbit. So we look at where things are at one point during the year, and we wait about six months. That makes it the biggest change possible. And we look at where things are um, the other, in that other location, basically. And we know the distance between those two locations because we know the distance between the sun and the earth. And so if we watch something, basically we'll go back and forth behind a, a background, we can measure how much um, back and forth motion there seems to be. And I don't want this to seem too complicated. We can actually do a very simple experiment with ourselves. If we've got, um, if we hold our thumb up and we cover up something, I'm gonna cover up the, the webcam and I close one eye, then the webcam's fully covered up. But as soon as I switch which eye is open or closed, my thumb has appeared to move back and forth um, between where I thought it was from one point of view and where it seems to be from the other point of view. And if I measured just how far it seemed to move 
and the distance between my eyes, I could do the same kind of thing um, and get the parallax. I'd figure out how far away my thumb was based on that background of the webcam and, and laptop. This also helps us think about the fact that if we are doing this with our thumb very close, there is a huge amount of change from the point as seen from one eye to the point as seen from the other. And if we do it really far away, there's a small amount of change. And so parallax is really, really good for nearby stars, and it becomes very, very difficult for very distant stars. And the equation involved is as simple as we can make it by cheating and coming up with brand new, um, brand new units to make it look this simple. So P is the parallax angle in arc seconds, and that's a standard unit. But the, the reason this can look so simple, P equals one over D, is because astronomers had to come up with this unit of parsecs in order to have this work out all nice um, and not have weird numbers attached to it. So if we, if we measure a parallax angle of one arc second, um, then that is a star that is one parsec away. And there's going to be a helicopter that will be some amount of background noise, but hopefully not too much. And the, the unit of parsec even comes from parallax and arc second. Uh, and so it, it really was created for this particular purpose. But again, the distance gets harder to do as we go further away. Yeah, the 3.26 is just because light year is based on the light speed. So, so that is kind of a fundamental physics idea. Parsecs are really designed just to make this particular equation look nice and simple. So we started to use it in astronomy all the time. I don't know why we really needed it um, when we could have just stuck with light years, but we, we like to be um, weird and confusing sometimes in astronomy. All right. so. When are we actually doing this? Um, actually, I'm going to go back a slide. So this idea of parallax, the ancient Greeks knew that this was a thing, right? Not with stars, but they could hold their thumb up and, and uh, switch which eye was open. The idea of things moving against the background is something that, that's been known for a long time. And the ancient Greeks actually tried to do this with stars. Their, their methods of observation were not precise enough to actually see a difference. And so their, their conclusion had to be that all of these stars were just the same distance away. We get this celestial sphere model that they, that they really kind of believed or just simplified as these are all things that are far away. But as we get better equipment, and on Earth, we can do this parallax measurement for some of the nearest stars, but to get really precise measurements and to get the ability to measure more distant stars, we have to do this by satellite. Um, many of you fully understand this idea that our atmosphere limits how, um, how our resolution can actually be um, through a telescope. And that, that limit on resolution is also gonna limit the ability to see a change from one part of the year to another with parallax. So Hipparchos was the first big satellite that did um, all of this. And um, with Hipparchos, it was launched in 1989, and it can see stars up to 50 parsecs away, so about 150 um, light years. And so for reference, the closest star to our solar system is 1.3 parsecs away. That's a measurable change um, visibly over the course of the year for ground-based telescopes and for Hipparchos. And that's great, but if we look at this map, which is not an actual picture of the Milky Way galaxy, I know we all know this, but it's always important to note, um, it's a real galaxy that's close enough um, for our purposes. That tiny little yellow dot, I'm gonna zoom in on it, that's how much Hipparchos can actually measure with parallax. So we're starting to see that this might not be the only measurement um, available to astronomers. We wouldn't be able to get very far, literally. So Gaia is the next step forward. Um, and the big mission objective is to be able to measure these positions and um, velocities of one billion stars in our galaxy. 
Our galaxy contains 200 billion stars. So it's a small fraction, but it is still very impressive. Um, it's also going to be collecting all this other data, brightness and temperature and composition. And it's going to try to create this three-dimensional map of the galaxy. Because if we can get all these different positions and how stars are moving, um, that's a really nice data set. And it really will be a very nice data set. Um, this, this image is one that I pulled that um, did a lot of the uh, calculations for me. We are somewhere here in 2021 in between with the Gaia um, satellite in between a data collection area that is bigger than this um, red circle, but we are not quite yet at that this big green um, circle. Yeah, Chris, I don't actually know how many releases Gaia has provided, but I do know that um, we're somewhere in between those two. So we've got a plan, basically. But even when Gaia has decided that it's done, this is still only going to be about half our galaxy. Because it's also the case that we can't measure a parallax if there's nothing in the background to be able to see this going back and forth idea for. So parallax is going to be great for getting stars inside our own galaxy, but it's definitely not going to help us do anything outside our galaxy. All right, so we have to move up the distance ladder. The idea behind the distance ladder, if we think about climbing a ladder, we put one foot on a rung, and then we have to have that be stable to get our foot up to the next rung. We can't just jump up to the very top. So we're going to talk about the next rung up. In order for us to be able to do that, though, we have to lay out some kind of key science ideas. So in general, there are two different types of brightness that is useful to us in astronomy. And they, there's technically two different types of brightness in everyday life. We just don't ever really have to worry about naming one versus the other. There's the idea that something is bright because it looks bright to us. That's apparent brightness. If someone shines a little tiny flashlight right in my face, it will look extremely bright, even if it's a very small flashlight. So apparent brightness is based on how bright things appear to be and that might mean that they are very bright themselves, or it could just mean they're very close to us, right? That light bulb shining in my face. The other type of brightness is the true, actual brightness of an object called absolute brightness. In, um, in astronomy, especially with stars, we're also going to call that luminosity all the time. Luminosity is also a word we, we have in physics and in everyday, um, in everyday life, too. If we read off a number value for a light bulb, that it's a 60 watt light bulb or it's a 100 watt light bulb, that is a luminosity. That's the true actual brightness of that light bulb, no matter if it's in our face or way down the hall. So the reason why these two things are different is because the star or light bulb or light source, whatever we wanna call it, is sending light off in all of these different directions. Okay, a flashlight is, is keeping a beam, but we're gonna, we're gonna ignore flashlights. There's, there's no cool giant space flashlights. Um, so we're gonna stick with stars and light bulbs. And so it's sending light off in all directions. If we think about where that light is at any given moment, it's kind of along big spheres that keep getting bigger and bigger. And the surface area of a sphere, four pi r squared, that R squared is really important to us when we start to think about stars looking bright versus being bright. So there's this um, inverse square law where things get dim as a function of one over R squared. If we're twice as far from something, it's a quarter the brightness. If we're three times as far away, it's a ninth the brightness, that kind of idea. So when we see really bright stars in the sky, a lot of the time it's because they're, they're close. They're really, they're in our stellar neighborhood or they're really, really bright stars um, in general. Okay, so the key thing then is if we know how bright an object is, how bright it inherently is, someone tells me that they have a 60 watt light bulb and we can measure how bright it appears from our point of view, with those two numbers, we can calculate the distance. Now, in general, stars in the sky, they have a whole range of possible brightnesses. It is not that easy to know for sure 
the absolute true brightness of a single star. So instead, there's a finite number of objects in astronomy that have a known, clear, measurable, or calculatable absolute brightness. And we call these things standard candles. We could call them standard light bulbs, but the definition is, is old enough that they're called standard candles. So if we have two 60 watt light bulbs and one is in our face and one is down the hall, the one in our face looks brighter, the one down the hall looks dimmer, but they are both the same absolute brightness. They are a standard candle. So the first of the two standard candles that I'm gonna focus, uh, focus our attention on are Cepheid variables. There's a couple of different types of variable stars, but Cepheid variables are the, are the really useful, um, really impressive ones. Now, variable stars in general are stars that are in the process of dying. They have lived a nice, healthy life for 90% of their overall expect expectancy at a single brightness, a single temperature, just kind of shining. And they're starting to run out of fuel in their cores. For certain stars, that process becomes really unstable and they go through this pulsating process where the, the star itself is physically getting larger and all that surface area is shining, which makes it brighter. And then it gets physically smaller again, less surface area, it gets less bright. These Cepheid variables actually helped us discover the idea that there are other galaxies in the world. So when, um, when Edwin Hubble found a Cepheid variable in Andromeda Galaxy in 1923, that distance measurement was enough to know for sure that is something else entirely. That's not just a spiral nebula um, that, is, that is close to us and small. It is this massive thing that looks small because it's really, really far away. So Cepheid variables are really cool. Um, they're, they're one of my favorite just objects that exist in astronomy. Now, there's different types of Cepheid variables. We're, uh, there's different types of variable stars. We're focusing on Cepheids because they're the brightest ones, which means they're the most useful to us. If it's brighter intrinsically, that means we can see it from further away. So Cepheid variables have absolute brightnesses, this true intrinsic brightness that are a thousand times brighter than the sun to 10,000 times brighter than the sun. Very useful for us to be able to see at large distances. And there's this very specific behavior that they have where their ability to get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, which again, this idea that they're physically getting larger and smaller, there is a clear relationship between their true brightness, their luminosity, and the period it takes for them to go from being very bright down to being very dim to being very bright again. So the example shown on the slide here, if we look, we've got um, a peak in brightness at uh, three days worth of tracking and another peak at nine days worth of tracking. This has a period of six days. Now, this statement here at the end, the big church bells compared to tiny jingle bells. If we think of a really large bell, for it to be able to ring multiple times, it's going like ding dong. It's a long period of time. The really, really bright, very big Cepheid variables have a longer period. And the smaller ones, the little jingle bells, we can go ding, 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 ding. They're the smaller ones that have a much shorter period, but they're also um, less luminous. They're just physically smaller. So we've got this great graph here um, uh, that shows a handful of Cepheid variables, all these different periods and the different luminosities. So the bigger it takes for them to get from bright spot to bright spot, the truly brighter they actually are. And the thing that we can then do because we can draw this clear line and have a relation between the period and luminosity, is we can physically measure the period with our telescopes. Any of us could do that just out in the backyard, finding a Cepheid and, and seeing how it changes brightness from one day to the next. And if we measured, for example, a period of 10 days, we would come over here to 10 days, we'd go up to where this is on the graph, and we would measure a luminosity that would be maybe 2000 solar luminosities. 
So very, very helpful for us. The point though, bringing it back to the distance ladder, is that this was originally a period apparent brightness relationship. Um, when these were being studied, they were all a set of Cepheid variables in the um, large Magellanic cloud. So we can't see that from Grand Rapids, but it's in Southern skies. It's actually a dwarf galaxy outside of our own, but we didn't know that when we were studying these. Um, so they did actually all have the same distance. So the relationship could be determined, but then we had to actually find several separate um, examples of these Cepheids that also had known parallax measurements. We had to make that calibration. So once we had enough of these Cepheid variables where we could see the apparent brightness and we knew the distance, we could figure out the actual true luminosities. And that becomes super helpful. So um, we've got this kind of flow of what's going on in order to determine the distance to a um, Cepheid variable. So we've got our astronomer looking through a telescope. I like that she has a stopwatch, like she's actually measuring this amount of time in, in seconds. It's gonna be on the order of days. So it's just like how bright it is one day to the next. But she's going over to the chart and she's figuring out, okay, this is how truly bright the luminosity is. With the telescope, we can see how bright it seems to be. And then we, we can do a quick calculation and get that distance value. That's excellent for us. The other type of standard candle is a type 1A supernova. So there's a lot of text on this slide and I'm gonna go through it start to finish. It's just kind of a fun um, history of where all of these different names even came from. So in 1572, Tycho Brahe saw a new point of light in the sky and he called it a Stella Nova. It was Tycho's star, everyone was super impressed. His government gave him a bunch of money to open up this new observatory. Um, it was not a new star. <laughs> it was a big brightening of an object and that brightening went away. The name stuck around though, and all of a sudden we had something that we could call a Nova whenever we saw something in the sky brighten and then get dim again. In 1929, Two astronomers, Walter Bodd and Fritz Zwicky, said there's a category of these brightenings that are so much brighter, second helicopter, sorry for that, so much brighter than these regular nova that they're not just nova, they're supernova. And so that supernova term is for a brightness that is way, way bigger than just this kind of flash of um, brief Brief brightening. Okay, so now we've got supernova. When we look at the spectrum of these supernova, it became very important to astronomers to determine if there were no strong hydrogen lines or if there were strong hydrogen lines. We had type one and type two. That became important to be able to learn more about these objects. And within type one, there were several separate details about helium lines, and we got type 1a, 1b, and 1c. The candle that, the standard candle that matters to us is the type 1a supernova. That's when a white dwarf explodes and completely, um, and is completely destroyed. So now we have to talk about what a white dwarf is. Our sun, our beautiful sun is middle-aged, it's been living for about 5 billion years. It will live for about 5 billion years doing its nice thing. But after that time, it's gonna shed its outer layers in a planetary nebula. Those are beautiful to look at through a telescope. And what will be left behind, its core, will have shrunk down to this hot, um, dense object that we call a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is the exposed core of low mass stars that shed their outer layers and their core collapses down, trying to be able to turn on another stage of fusion to power itself, but it never gets there. And it gets um, held up against gravity by electron degeneracy pressure. That's a fancy term. What it means is each of those different atoms, the electron clouds are repelling each other and we've squashed 
all of that mass down as much as we can without fundamentally altering the, um, the structure of those atoms. So a white dwarf is extremely, extremely dense. It's also very, very hot because if you condense down a gas or plasma, it heats up. So white dwarfs then, they'll just, they'll just chill out and slowly cool down over time. Like if I have a cup of coffee and I put it on my desk and forget about it, it just cools off over time. So white dwarfs themselves are not actually all that interesting. What we need is a white dwarf that has another companion, a companion that adds extra mass to it in the process of that companion dying. And we talked about just now the fact that we have squashed all those atoms down so that the electron clouds are up against each other. If we were to add more pressure pushing down uh, or more gravity rather trying to pull everything together, we would have to fundamentally change the structure of those atoms. And that's what happens in a type 1a supernova. We add a little bit too much mass and those atoms crunch down and the electrons get shoved into the protons and there's way too much energy and the white dwarf is not able to survive that and it explodes. It is completely wiped out. The key thing that makes it so useful as a standard candle is that breaking point is based on physics. A white dwarf that has a mass of 1.4 times the mass of our sun is right at that breaking point. And so when we see one of these type 1a supernova, it's exactly the same kind of object that is exploding with exactly the same amount of stuff. It's the same pile of dynamite, basically. So that becomes extremely, extremely useful to us because we know by tracking enough of these how bright they truly are, and each one that we see is going to be that same amount of brightness, the same amount of dynamite. So that's a really great standard candle also. The other nice thing is it is really bright to have a supernova, which means we can see these type 1a supernova really far away in distant galaxies and in nearby galaxies. Um, we haven't actually seen any in the Milky Way galaxy. The closest observed type 1a supernova to date was only 11 and a half million light years away, only. So if we look at our distance ladder now, I've talked about these middle rungs um, kind of together. We have a direct measurement when we talk about parallax. We studied Cepheid variables enough with enough of these Cepheids that have um, known parallax measurements that we can now calibrate those two together and now we've got a strong rung for the Cepheid variables. If we have enough galaxies that contain Cepheid variables that are measurable and they've had a type 1a supernova, that allows us to calibrate, calibrate and figure out that intrinsic brightness of that standard candle. So this kind of in-between jump that we take with our feet on this ladder is nearby galaxies, ones that have to contain both Cepheid variables and type 1a supernova. And that's great if a galaxy has a type 1a supernova, but we want to be able to know the distance to any galaxy, even if it does not contain a type 1a supernova. So we need one extra rung of this ladder to be able to cover all of the distances, including distances that are way too far away to have a measurable um, brightening from a type 1a supernova. And here's where we, where we get to redshift. So back in the 1920s, Vesto Slipher was measuring the Doppler shift of several galaxies, which at the time he did not even know that they were galaxies. It were, it, they were called nebulae. We, we know about um, different types of nebula um, from all of the cool observing that we um, all do, but these were called spiral nebulae because we didn't know that they were separate galaxies. There were no distance measurements yet. And he was figuring out something very strange. All of these spiral nebulae, uh, which some of them looked small and some of them looked kind of bigger, they were all moving away from us. So Doppler shift, um, kind of a standard, very brief um, background of what Doppler shift is. If we look at the spectrum of a star, 
that whole spectrum will get red shifted or blue shifted based on whether things are moving away from us, red shift, or towards us, blue shift. So with this initial understanding, George Lemaitre started doing a bunch of theory on paper and Edwin Hubble started doing a bunch of observations with his telescope. And they were both gathering information from what we now call the Hubble Lemaitre law. And that law is quite straightforward. It's just that the velocity that we can measure from the Doppler shift is equal to a constant called the Hubble constant, H naught, times the distance away from, uh, that an object is. And all of these points are kind of indicating measurements along the line. And that line is very simply just velocity equals H naught times distance, where the slope of that line is that Hubble constant. Okay, so we have this excellent piece of um, science, but why is this happening? The galaxies are red shifted because they are moving away from us. They're all moving away from us because the universe itself is expanding. Now, the reason why the universe is expanding would be a whole separate talk. It sounds like we've planned talk number three, so maybe this will be talk number four. But the idea that these things are all moving away from us um, the common models that we can have in our head, because this, this stuff starts to get really brain melty, but the common models we can have in our head are like raisin bread, where if you bake raisin bread, all the raisins start to get further away from each other in a very measurable way that fits this Hubble law. Or um, if we were to draw different um, galaxies on a balloon and then blow that balloon up, they would also all get uh, separated from each other in a way that looked very similar to this Hubble law. So how far does our ladder go? When we want to think about distances, that's helicopter number three, that's kind of impressive. When we want to think about distances, the methods that we've talked about, this idea of a distance ladder is really important for us to understand. There has to be overlap in these methods because past parallax, none of them are direct measurements. So parallax, the closest star to us is four light years away. So it could measure things closer, but there's nothing closer to measure. And with Gaia, the intention is that it's gonna be able to get up to 300, uh, sorry, 30,000 light years away from um, our solar system. Cepheid variables, the closest one to us aren't that close, but we can see them without them being too dim to be visible up to about 60 million light years. After that, Cepheid variables exist, but they aren't bright enough, enough for us to notice. Type 1a supernova, we talked about how the closest one to us measured so far is 11 million light years. A type 1a supernova absolutely could happen closer to us. It could happen in the Milky Way galaxy. It's just rare enough that we shouldn't plan on it. We shouldn't expect it. So the usefulness of the type 1a supernova goes from about 10 million light years out to about 3 billion light years. This is a really, really bright explosion. So it does a very good job of being able to measure very large distances. And then the Hubble law, um, the Hubble Lemaitre law starts at around 300 million light years um, and extends as far as we can, as far as we can actually measure light from galaxies. Um, and it becomes the latter up to infinity. The one thing I want to note about all of these different measurements is that the calibration is kind of constantly being uh, clarified and updated. And type 1a supernova, the ones way at the edge of um, the uh, distance here, they were actually the type of observation that allowed us to figure out that not only is the um, universe expanding, but that expansion rate is accelerating. So it was observations of these standard candles because they are standard candles that allowed us to figure out that the universe was accelerating. So th that's um, observations from the 1990s uh, and the, the Nobel Prize in physics from 2015 or 2014. So kind of cool. So all of these different tools are the way that we've figured out where we actually are. We are on Earth. 
we can measure some some radar around we can send a laser over to the moon and back to figure out how far away it is within the inner solar system we can use radar quite easily with the outer solar system maybe we're sending back and forth to our deep space network rather than really bouncing something off um, rather than bouncing something something off a an object uh, the the question in the chat is a very good one i'm going to save it for just a little bit but it's very important and useful i'm going to talk about it right here in this local group so the closest stars to us they have gotten mapped out through parallax all those closest stars parallax is the prime measurement um tool for us to map out the milky way galaxy there are a whole lot of different um methods for measuring distance within our milky way galaxy that i haven't covered because they're not one of those core required rungs to have a viable distance ladder and then the local group has been mostly mapped out through cepheid variables the local group is the group of um, galaxies that are gravitationally bound together. So the question in the chat from Jim about if the universe is expanding, why is Andromeda on a collision course with us? And the very simple answer is gravity. It's part of our neighborhood. Our local group is a self-contained structure that is still staying together, kind of like the whole raisin within the raisin bread. It's that cluster that will continue to kind of move around each other, Gravity is pulling Milky Way and Andromeda together uh, in about 3 billion years. Uh, we'll have this nice collision course, um, but that's not in the Hubble flow because of gravity. The Laniakia um, supercluster is our way to describe our local group, which we can kind of treat like a neighborhood, and the Laniaka supercluster is all these different neighborhoods. So maybe we start to think of that rather than a, a, single, um, a single neighborhood. We've got lots of neighborhoods. Maybe we're talking about a city or a state of these separate um, gravitationally bound things. These superclusters are the last structure that we can really think about as being not quite fully part of that Hubble flow, the expansion of the universe. But once we get beyond that, we have the observable universe, which is expanding at a um, rate that is accelerating. So kind of cool stuff. That was all of the different things I wanted to talk about start to finish. Um, and I want to open it up to, to questions. Well, I'll kick that off. Um, in using, you know, I mean, Parallax and redshift and, of course, radar, well, within the local group, I mean, those are all things that are, if you will, intentional measurements. You can decide on an object and then say, okay, let's perform an experiment to come up with some data for a measurement. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, but with Cepheids and with the supernova, then those are more like chance measurements. I mean, unless you've actually observed a Cepheid in something that's within that range, that distance range that you mentioned, you know, you can say, yes, we know there's a galaxy there. How far away is it? Well, so correct. almost. So, so you can't just do a, you know, a, a glow, an inventory of the universe based on Cepheids and 1A supernovas. You have to rely on, you know, next month we'll have a couple more added to the inventory, but it's not exactly. something that you can't plan it. The, the nice thing is the type 1A supernova, all we really need is enough to calibrate the Hubble law. And then we can rely on that Hubble's law to, to basically do all the heavy lifting for us for distant galaxies. Oh. For Cepheids, it's worth noting, they certainly don't last forever, but in terms of kind of human time scales, if we've identified a Cepheid, we'll be able to track it getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer for, for pretty much for our whole lifetimes. Um, so those Cepheid variable stars, they don't last forever, but they are not just a single event. They'll, they'll keep getting brighter and dimmer in a very measurable way. But you're right, the type 1A supernova, we don't want to rely on it heavily for a kind of consistent way to measure distances. We needed it, though, to be that rung to get to the top of the ladder. Okay, all right. Yep. And it which point is the redshift? I mean, how far away does something have to be for the redshift to be effective? I mean, I mean, obviously there isn't going to be a redshift between us and the moon, but there is. Yeah, so you know, the, 
the redshift has to be outside the local group. So that, that gets back to Jim's original question about the universe expanding, but Andromeda heading towards us. Things are only going to be moving away from us if we're outside the group of galaxies that we're part of. So the Milky Way, the small and large Magellanic clouds, the Andromeda galaxy, those are all things that are gravitationally bound. We're not seeing redshift for those. We're actually seeing blue shift. Uh, Andromeda is oh. heading towards us. Okay. All right. Um, I see the question in the chat about the two different measurements of the expansion, but I need a little clarification on what you mean by that. If you measure the expansion of the universe by type 1a, mm -hmm. you get one value. If you measure the expansion by the CMB, you get a different value, and the error bars do not overlap. And I've been fascinated by this for, what, last couple, three years. So I, I'm throwing you a bone. You can ignore it if you wish. Oh. I mean, it's, it's a very fascinating topic. That does get into detailed enough cosmology that that is outside my wheelhouse. And I agree it's fascinating. And I'm glad that there are people working on that. Um, but, but that's not something that I, that I have any insight into. I can go get a second PhD and work on it. But uh, mm -hmm. until then, I probably can't tell you much more than you've, than you've been reading up on. Yes. It just it turns out that it was one of those assumptions that they were going to overlap and they would find this kind it of should. <laughs> happy ground. And then instead, what they're actually, the more data that comes in, the more clearly they seem to be separate measurements. And it's like... The excitement is this could mean there's new physics to be discovered. Exactly. That keeps a lot of people in jobs. I have a question. Oh, Steve. Somebody else did. Who, who was first? <laughs> well, this is Randy. You can go first. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, I've heard that there's been some discussion, a little controversy about type 1A supernovas that perhaps they're not the most reliable standard candle after all. Can yeah. you shed me some light on that? <laughs> I sure can. So, so that one I can tell you about. It, it's also unresolved, but it's, it's, a straightforward, um, it's a straightforward problem. So when we call something a type 1a supernova, it's because we can see the spectrum of what elements are there. So we know that we're talking about a white dwarf um, because of the elements that are missing from it. And uh, so we know what it's made out of. The controversy is the way I described it the nice classical view of type 1a supernova is it's one single white dwarf that is at the maximum mass it can have, called the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses. And that thing has just been pushed over the limit. And so we've got 1.4 solar masses worth of white dwarf that is exploding. However, now that we have started to see um, several different, um, we'll see, now that we've been able to detect several different con confirmations of neutron-neutron star mergers and black hole-black hole mergers with gravitational waves, we also recognize that it's very likely that a white dwarf could merge with another white dwarf. In that case, that would be more stuff that is exploding, but it would still look like the same kind of stuff. And that would cause an explosion that is called a type 1a supernova and is brighter than that classical definition. And that, that causes some, some problems then for us trying to use it as a distance measurement. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Lauren, what's the current accepted, uh, well, value for the Hubble constant? I forget, you keep changing, I see. Oh, goodness. Um, I, I do not remember that one off the top of my head. It's 70 something. Um, kilometers per second per megaparsec, uh, but I do not know the number off the and top of my 67. head. And 67. Oh, it's 67. Oh and my goodness, bars, it's changed since grad school. bars do not overlap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was I probably have to do my, uh, updo my slides for my I know, class. I should too. <laughs> so the, the idea that this, this slope nearby like the nearby slope for this is fairly well known. It's, it's once we get further and further distances that 
it's not really a straight line anymore. And that's, that's when we're starting to talk about something that's more complicated than just a line on a graph. And that's where those different numbers come in. Thank you for this presentation. Did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. And I um I sent the slides to to Chris, so um he'll hopefully put them where where people at least in in the group can see them. Um, the only slides I didn't show us is a list of of different things I didn't talk about. The smaller rungs in the ladder that if they're missing from your ladder, it's not a big deal. You can still climb up to the top. Um, and then a list of where all these different pictures came from, because that's always important and useful to, to know. Okay. Yeah, we'll be offering the, um, Perfect. the, going forward, we will have the, we'll have this um, slides, uh, the PDF anyway, available from our website. And then we will also then have the video on our um, YouTube channel. And by the way, if you just go into YouTube and and do a search for GRAAA. Apparently it's an acronym that's not in a lot of use because you'll hit our, you know, our um, site, uh, our YouTube channel comes up pretty quickly, pretty early in those results. So we've got a few videos out there. Um, so this will be there as well. So yes, Perfect. thank you. Yeah, of course there's, yeah, there's lots, there's some nuances to that distance ladder that you can yeah. then pick up on. And that's a nice segue. One of the things Dave mentioned in the, the very nice uh, introduction is the, the role I have as Open Educational Resource Coordinator. So I teach my classes with OpenStax Astronomy. It's a free textbook. Um, and we're just talking about YouTube slides, uh, YouTube videos. Um, the, the whole class I teach, the videos related to it, not all the cool assignments and projects that students do, but all the videos related to the course um, are available for free on YouTube. You just have to search Lauren Wolsey Astronomy and you'll find them. Oh. Um, so if, if there's a particular topic you're interested in, I've probably got a video um, that, that you can at least get that introductory astronomy survey overview um, if you're interested. 